My name is Colette Murphy and I'm the CEO of the Atkinson Foundation. It's good to have so many people with us this evening, students, public sector and nonprofit leaders, residents, grassroots organizers, academics, and policy researchers. Welcome on behalf of Atkinson, the City Institute at York University, the School of Cities at University of Toronto, City Building Ryerson, and of course, the Toronto Community Benefits Network. I'm pleased to be here with you on the traditional territories of many nations, the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas of the Credit, and Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and home today to many First Nation, Métis, and Inuit people. These territories are covered by Treaty 13 and the Dish with One Spoon Wampum. The Dish with One Spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississauga, and Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. I wanna also acknowledge the continued effort of land protectors and water keepers to negotiate their inherent right to the land. As we know, land acknowledgements are a way to recognize and honor the traditional indigenous territories of a place. They have been com common to make at the start of an event. However, the fact that non-indigenous people make these statements does not necessarily translate into deep understanding of their importance or different behavior. As I reflected on incorporating an acknowledgement into the welcome, it was clear that the issue of land, our relationship to it, and most importantly, who determines and benefits from its development is central to tonight's conversation about the kind of economy we build out of the wreckage of this pandemic. As many of you may be aware, Atkinson has been championing community benefits as a tool for helping build stronger movements for racial justice, decent work and a fair economy for years. We've been honored to do this work alongside many partners, including Rosemary Powell and Kum Sabakar at TCBN. Practically, community benefits create conditions to ensure communities who have been historically and persistently excluded, particularly Black, Indigenous and racialized communities have meaningful input into public infrastructure development processes and, as importantly, realize material benefits from them through things like employment and training opportunities, procurement, and affordable housing. We know these exclusions that have created growing income and wealth inequality have not been accidents. They are a direct result of systems born out of racism, colonialism, and white supremacy. Community benefits are one tool to support a larger ambition to transform the rules of economic development from a zero sum game where some win and others lose to a positive sum game where no one wins at the expense of others. We have made incredible progress. We have real wins, billions in infrastructure projects with CD requirements in Ontario right now. Now more than ever, we must harness their full power to support the ambition to renew our local economies from the ground up where equity is baked into our city building efforts, not sprinkled on. I'm very much looking forward this evening to hearing from what our panelists have to speak about this evening and from all of you. So I'm now gonna just talk a little bit about the agenda. It's pretty straightforward. After introductions by our moderator, we'll hear from three panelists and then we'll have an opportunity to engage in some questions with them. You can submit your questions in the Q&A function. Brief questions are most likely to get answered given our time constraints. A few other housekeeping items. We encourage you to introduce yourself to each other in the chat box. Second, we are learning every day about how to use this technology. So we thank you in advance for your patience if there are any technical difficulties and I'm sure TCBN will resolve them as quickly as possible. Third, this webinar is being recorded and we're committed to having a respectful conversation that welcomes diverse points of views and trust you are too. And finally, we want to amplify this conversation in as many places as we can. So we uh, encourage you all this evening to take to social media using the hashtags inclusive recovery and community benefits. So now I get the great honor to introduce our moderator, Grace Edward Galabuzzi, who is the Associate Professor at Ryerson University. 
But Grace is so much more than this. He is a leading voice in this country on how systemic racism lies at the foundation of economic inequality and what we do about it. He's an academic, an organizer, and an activist whose knowledge and wisdom I have learned so much from over the years. And full disclosure, he's a former board member of the foundation that I now run. Grace Edward, over to you, uh, and we look forward to the rest of the evening. Thanks. Colette, thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, both for the work that you have been doing uh, over the many years that uh, uh, I have known you. Um, I don't think we have enough time for me to actually go through the, the list of the tremendous breakthroughs that you've been responsible for suddenly have contributed to in terms of economic justice in this city. But we are both thankful uh, and proud of the work that, that you do. And I certainly am thankful of the opportunity to share uh, a few words with uh, our audience today and uh, with uh, a strong panel uh, that will address uh, questions that are critical in this particular moment. Um, I want to start by saying that uh, I, I am encouraged uh, by some of the organizing that's happening in the community around issues not just related to COVID-19, which I want to speak about for just a moment, but related to economic justice more broadly and the work that's being done both by uh, some of our panelists uh, and the leadership that is being provided by, uh, uh, by uh, Rosemary and others at the Toronto Community Benefits Network, uh, but also work that is being done by particularly young people in this city. Uh, in terms of uh, economic justice. Uh, we have not always led with economic justice, uh, particularly in some of our communities, but economic justice has become an important uh, touch point, touchstone in terms of the work uh, of uh, uh, liberation uh, that we many of us are involved in, and that's, that's wonderful. I wanna say that as the COVID-19 pandemic spread through uh, Canada, proclamations from governments uh, about a virus that does not discriminate, not just governments, but also the media, uh, belied, was, were belied by the names and faces of those who were actually perishing from COVID-19. Now, months after widespread stay-at-home orders uh, have taken place, we know that uh, these stories are in no way anecdotal. They reflect massive systemic inequalities at the intersection of race and social class that amplify both, I should add gender, race, class, and gender, that amplify both the chances of being infected by COVID-19 and the barriers to receiving proper protection and care uh, from this pandemic. Uh, Race-based data now collected by the Toronto Public Health shows that uh, black and brown Torontonians make up 73% of the COVID-19 cases while representing 36% of the population of Toronto. In stark contrast, uh, white Torontonians represent about one fifth of all the COVID uh, cases while making up about half uh, of the population. So there's a class, there's a race and gender intersection to this pandemic, which simply exacerbates pre-existing vulnerabilities in the Canadian and Ontario economies that have seen many local communities in neighborhoods where indigenous black and other racialized groups live predominantly. So COVID-19 does not choose its victims on its own. Instead, Canadian society has structured itself, the economy and the society broadly speaking, to ensure that those most likely to suffer poor health outcomes are black, brown and indigenous Canadians who earn lower wages and have the least amount of wealth uh, in the society because of the social determinants of health extend to employment opportunities, to sectors of the economy as they're sorted out uh, by uh, these uh, structures and forms of work. Those who are most likely to be experiencing precarious forms of work, racialized and often poor people across uh, uh, that have access to uh, those types of jobs. And again, the other dimension, a critical dimension is the gender dimension. White Canadians uh, who may have more economic resources are not protected entirely uh, but they are more protected than the other, uh, uh, the other populations in terms of these outcomes. So gender, uh, gender intersections must also be acknowledged, though there is no simple way to reduce these things to a singular advantage or disadvantage. 
that kind of analysis is not helpful. But it is important to understand that there's, there's a systemic nature to these uh, uh, processes and outcomes, that systemic racism, uh, as Colette was suggesting, manifests in different ways. It manifests different ways when it comes to uh, black, brown, and indigenous uh, uh, women and men or LGBTQ individuals. And so they are affected by different, out different processes and different outcomes and the, to the extent that we see some of the data that is uh, coming out of the pandemic. A black man tend to be more affected, for instance, by other processes like police violence, for instance, indigenous life expectancy and uh, general uh, health outcomes also are significantly varied by gender. So that the question of the data that we have, which is still very incomplete, already suggests that there's a need for us to look at these various phenomena, uh, race, gender, and social class as being critical to understanding what is happening with the experience of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. One of the uh, common arguments regularly profiled in the media and elsewhere uh, is that uh, racial uh, inequality is not a primary problem. I wanna suggest that it's probably not a useful argument to have because racial and economic inequality intersect in a critical way and are essential to understanding some of the challenges that, that we face and to thinking through how we can resolve or address those challenges. Uh, many studies have shown that COVID-19 uh, has, uh, <clears throat> has exposed what essentially was a pre-existing uh, vulnerability amongst uh, racialized uh, and uh, indigenous populations and that the race poverty axis is very real. Systemic racism lies at the foundation of economic inequality in Canada. Now, excluded from these uh, realities in terms of the stay-at-home uh, orders were Canadians whose jobs were deemed essential service. Uh, those who are working in long-term care, uh, personal support workers, for instance, uh, those who are working as grocery uh, uh, clerks, uh, transit operators, and so on, or hotel, uh, <coughs> hotel uh, workers and so on. So these are professions uh, that carry a higher risk of infection by virtue of their ongoing proximity to others. And surprisingly, data has demonstrated massive differences in uh, infections of COVID-19 between working class, uh, mostly black and brown and indigenous people who predominate these kinds of jobs in uh, the uh, Canadian economy and uh, uh, non-racialized uh, people who pre pre predominate uh, higher wage office jobs that have allowed them to stay at home and shelter uh, uh, from risk and work using Zoom. So as an example, Statistics Canada demonstrates that uh, black people, particularly black women, as well as Filipino women, are more likely to be personal support workers uh, than other uh, racial groups. And the early, uh, uh, early data that's been collected shows that that has exposed them significantly to these challenges. Let me just say something about this question of uh, labor market sorting. It's a term that uh, economists uh, use to refer to the clustering of social groups in specific groups. Uh, some work that I and others have done show that this phenomenon is not an accident. It is based on deficiencies in opportunities that are available to black and brown and indigenous people. Labor market sorting by race and class is entirely the result of a confluence of uh, structural features of, in society. That those include how race and racism works uh, in systems such as uh, school systems, but also in the uh, labor market, and how, to some extent, it is responsible for the uh, difference, differences or disparities in generational wealth and uh, family uh, income. So about 12 years ago, uh, while doing research in Black Creek, we were rudely introduced to the concept of place-based discrimination. The idea that residents are denied opportunity even in their own communities because employers discriminate against them on the basis of the location in which they live. We, we recognize, for instance, uh, in the work that we did that uh, Yorkdale Shopping Mall had employers who would deny uh, 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 young people in particular 
who came from Lawrence Heights, an opportunity to work in their, uh, in their businesses because they came from Lawrence Heights. It became clear that one critical way to address the place-based discrimination is to strengthen local communities themselves and to seed and create jobs in the communities themselves. And one way to do uh, this is to generate a lot of local economic activity and insist on local hiring. Holding the biggest institutional employers accountable, whether those are government or private sector, accountable for the economic activity and local hiring is a critical response by society and community and, and ensures community beneficiation, leveraging our citizenship, our residents, and our government and corporate citizens accountability through a community benefits framework is a unique and powerful way to address some of the uh, inequities that are historical and impact uh, communities uh, in those uh, neighborhoods. So not only does it help us address the multiple crises, the economic, the ecological and social and health crises that are both historical, current and ongoing, uh, but it also helps us address the question of social inclusion that I think our colleagues spoke to. It is the work of economic justice uh, and activists uh, in economic justice that we are going to talk about today, that many of our uh, panelists are involved in and are organized uh, by the leadership of the Toronto Community Benefits Network to demand the restructuring of community benefits programs that are transformative or potentially transformative in individuals' lives. The commitment to an uh, outcome-based program with targets and timetables is essential. Today we'll hear how some of these programs work, how they've been successful in other jurisdictions, and how they can work and in some cases are working uh, in Toronto. So I want to acknowledge that we are in this tremendous, uh, powerful moment, uh, in a moment where, yes, on the one hand, the pandemic, uh, the, the pandemic has impacted small businesses, uh, jobs have disappeared, and our local economies have been devastated. Uh, but it's also a moment in which we are reflecting on racial economic justice as critical, and also thinking through the, uh, the need for environmental sustainability. So all levels of government are committed to investing billions of dollars to build, to repair, to retrofit public uh, infrastructure uh, over the next decade. And I believe that as we talk about called building back better, this is the time to shape strong community benefits policies that prioritize equity, economic justice, and a fair set of local, uh, local communities. So I wanna introduce uh, the people who are uh, part of this uh, really important panel today. Um, and I wanna start with, uh, um, I think Maddie goes first. And Maddie Simiatiki is the interim director of the School of uh, Cities and a professor of uh, geography and planning at the city of Toronto. Uh, there's a longer uh, uh, introduction uh, bio uh, that goes with his name, but uh, in the interest of time, I just I'll just provide that for now and uh, ask him to uh, speak. Grace, Ed Grace Edwards, I believe Rosemary is up uh, before me. Well, what do you know? <laughs> <laughs> that is Rosemary, not not Maddie first. Uh, ap apologies. Uh, so Rosemary is the executive director of the Toronto Community Benefits Network. I've known Rosemary for many years working in the community. I much appreciate her work and uh, I'm glad that she's going first. Rosemary. Thank you very much, uh, Grace. Uh, I, it is a real pleasure for me to be here today. We are at a pivotal moment for community benefits in Toronto and, uh, you know, uh, we have a lot that we can accomplish going forward with a strong community benefits framework at the City of Toronto. Before I uh, get into that, I thought this would be a good moment to give a little bit of a background about the Toronto Community Benefits Network and uh, the work that we've been doing to date and why we think it's important that we double down as we seek to rebuild from COVID on community benefits as a tool for economic development for people who have been underrepresented in the workforce and particularly in this construction industry. Next slide. 
So uh, the Toronto Community Benefits Network is a community labor coalition. Uh, we have a membership base of over 120 member organizations and groups now from across the city. And we have 10 of the largest construction unions who are members of our organization. And at the end of the day, TCBN is the only nonprofit incorporated organization that was specifically uh, uh, come together to negotiate community benefits agreements to track, monitor, and support the implementation within the city of Toronto. Uh, we have 10 of the largest unions who are members of the TCBN who are there as a support and standing with community as allies to ensure equity, diversity, and inclusion in the construction industry. At TCBN, we also walk the talk um, we have emerged into a Black-led uh, organization with a majority of our staff representing the cross-section of identities that uh, CBAs are intended to benefit, Black, Indigenous, and racialized peoples with a focus on youth, women, and newcomers. These are people who, through research and statistics, and just by looking on the job sites when we pass by, uh, we see that there is a significant underrepresentation of these communities um, in building up our city. Um, and our entire focus is about uh, negotiating community benefits agreements and supporting their implementation. Our goal is for good jobs and economic opportunities for communities uh, through investment in infrastructure and urban development. We uh, focus on four key areas when we negotiate a community benefits agreements. We want to see construction apprenticeships while the project is being built, access to professional administrative and technical jobs within the industry, social procurement, as well as neighborhood and environmental improvements. Next slide. This is just to give you a sense of uh, the vast membership that we have of community organizations and groups, labor organizations and groups, and social enterprises across the city. Next slide. And at the end of the day, community benefits really is built on the values of equity, diversity, and inclusion. And our goal is to see that uh, these community benefits are negotiated with the community, not for the community. We want to ensure that a community benefits agreement are legally binding and that there are specific commitments for local and social jobs and opportunities, that there's oversight by the community throughout the project life cycle from the planning stages uh, to the design and build and even the operation and maintenance of the project. We know that these investments in billions of dollars of taxpayer uh, funds can really generate good jobs and opportunities for everyone. We also want to ensure that the commitments that we have negotiated, that there is a process in place to do the monitoring evaluation and enforcement of these contracts. And so that is why today we are, uh, you know, sharing this information, uh, you know, with our ecosystem, and we really appreciate the support of Ryerson uh, University of Toronto and the York University and uh, the Atkinson Foundation and our other key stakeholders in helping us to organize this session today. When we think about the City of Toronto's community benefits framework that was established. Uh, last year, we're now one year in, and we did identify a number of uh, 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 areas in which the agreement, uh, the framework could be strengthened, and now is our opportunity. And I got to tell you, with COVID, uh, you know, uh, in 2020, you know, just, uh, you know, coming and causing the, the, the kinds of devastation that we have seen, here is our opportunity to use community benefits agreements as a process uh, to be able to, um, to, uh, to help to rebuild better. Next slide, please. And so 
Uh, for some more background, uh, TCBN, uh, our purpose is to negotiate and support the implementation of community benefits agreements. And the first project that we worked on was the Eglinton Crosstown project, which is an $8.5 billion uh, project that is funded by the government of uh, Ontario through taxpayer dollars. And we recognized very early as a community labor coalition that this project was basically running through uh, you know, many neighborhood improvement areas that were already struggling with issues of high unemployment and, um, and, and economic disparity. And so with the community benefits agreement, we were able to negotiate directly with Metrolinx for some specific commitments for that local community. And uh, we are seeing really good results now, several years later. Over 370 people have been hired on the Eglinton Crosstown project. And, uh, you know, this is, uh, you know, quite an accomplishment that would not have happened without uh, a community benefits framework in place that really acted as the North Star for where all stakeholders needed to align themselves to be able to implement the heavy lifting that was required to actually outreach to people in their local communities and support them to be able to enter into the community benefits pathway into the jobs and opportunities. Since the Eglinton Crosstown project, we have been able to negotiate additional projects. Next slide, please. Like the Finch West LRT, we also have in that same community in Jane and Finch, uh, the York University who has actually uh, implemented a community benefits uh, or social procurement program to hire from the local community. Next slide, please. And uh, we also, uh, through years of organizing, even before the TCBN actually started, uh, years of organizing in Rexdale for a community benefits agreement on the Casino Woodbine project. And uh, without that level of organiz organizing that happened, today we would not be seeing 27% of people from equity seeking groups actually having an opportunity on the Casino Woodbine uh, project. And we also have the West Park Healthcare Center, which is an initiative that we just launched uh, two days ago uh, to the community, where finally, after years of organizing and coming together as stakeholders, we've been able to create a really great partnership with the industry, with the general contractor, with the West Park Healthcare Center to get uh, people from the local community onto that, onto that uh, project. And it's a project that's going to be in that community for years to come, and it's gonna create more opportunities for the local community. And now they're fully focused on the concepts of equity, diversity, and inclusion. And that is all as a result of coming together around the concept and the process of negotiating community benefits agreements. Next slide, please. We also have other campaigns that TCBN is uh, uh, developing. For example, the Golden Mile Community Impact Network, the Parkdale People's Economy, we support that with our 120 member organizations and groups. All these organizations who are committed to community benefits are in the process of looking at how they can use the community benefits platform to be able to negotiate for themselves. I want to tell you about the Region Park Community Benefits uh, Coalition and the success that we were able to achieve there uh, with the local community negotiating directly with Toronto Community Housing for a community benefits agreement on the phase four, phase five, uh, uh, phase four, phase five redevelopment. We've also done work at the local, provincial and national level uh, to, 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 to advocate for more community benefits at the policy level so that we don't have to fight as a community every time that a new project comes online. We want to see community benefits agreements established as the way of doing business. Next slide, please. 
And so uh, with the City of Toronto's Community Benefits Framework, when it was established in 2019, we recognized that there were some areas that needed to be strengthened. We knew that we needed to come back to the table and to think about what a hard target or a minimum hard target would look like. For us, we think it's unacceptable to not have a specific goal that everyone can align themselves around. We want to see, like we've done with all other projects that TCBN is currently working on, that there is a minimum standard of 10% of uh, hiring on the project for people who are Black, Indigenous, and racialized with a focus on women, newcomers, and youth. We want to ensure that uh, you know, all the stakeholders can come together and be able to align around this work. And TCBN is here as a partner uh, to be able to accomplish this. A strategic partner with the city that has the relationships in place with the unions, with the industry, and with our local community partners to really coordinate and align ourselves around the city's goal. And so uh, the city's report that was to come back to council is now out. It came out on the 20th of January. And we have identified there are still some areas that still need strengthening. And that's why we're going to need your support. We think city staff have done a good report to really break down all the issues and challenges with community benefits and how community benefits needs to be strengthened. And they have identified that there is a real need to figure out the implementation process. How do we get people from a commitment onto the job site? And I know that they're putting forward a strong recommendation for how the city can invest in the required staffing at the city to be able to implement, uh, to develop those systems and to implement. And that there is a proposal for how to work with the community and uh, the industry partners to make that happen. What we want to see is that that report becomes even more stronger and that we actually set those minimum targets so that everybody knows what they're working towards. Next uh, slide, please. And so uh, TCBN is here as a support. We have developed our expertise in terms of supporting the access uh, for people who are underrepresented into the industry, into the community benefits employment services pathway. We provide supports from uh, outreach and recruitment to intake and assessment. Um, and we provide career exploration, essential skills, an apprenticeship and career readiness program, as well as job skills uh, training that helps to connect folks into the pipeline for the unionized construction trades. Importantly, we have a mentoring program, which is in partnership with the, the unions and with the contractors. Um, and it's called the Next Gen Builders Mentoring Program. And through COVID in 2020, we had over 500 people register to take that program because we elevated our efforts to make sure that we were going to be supporting those people who had been devastated by the pandemic and who basically saw the opportunities that they were finally getting in the industry uh, practically disappear. And we kept it all together. And with the support of industry from ACON, from Carpenters Union and the IBEW and other partners, we were able to support 200, over 200 people um, into the um, Next Gen Builders Mentoring Program and supported over nine, 90, uh, close to 100 people uh, into a unionized um, uh, construction trade during COVID. This is the kind of work, the kind of uh, capacity that TCBN's ecosystem and our membership has built up to be able to support this work. And uh, we need to see an actual target in place that is going to let us know what is that North Star that we all are going to be focused on, whether it be the union, the contractor, the community services organizations, the pre-apprenticeship training providers, and the individuals themselves. So uh, that's just a, a, a bit of an overview of TCBN's work, and I look forward to answering any questions that folks might have uh, after um, all the panelists have had a chance to speak. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rosemary. Uh, let me just say a couple of quick things. One is that um, I may uh, play an academic today uh, on TV, but I wasn't always an academic. I was once an organizer. And I can tell you that what Rosemary has said about the institutional building that has happened with regard to uh, the uh, Toronto Community Benefits Network represents tremendous work and tremendous sacrifice, right? So I wanna uh, both thank her and invite the, the rest of us to big her up. I wanna use that language, big her up for that tremendous work that she has done, bringing together uh, the various uh, building trades unions with the community organizations, with the institutional employers, with the uh, granting agencies like uh, uh, like the Atkinson Foundation, with the uh, <clears throat> universities, uh, both as uh, intellectual leaders on this project, but also as uh, employers and uh, key uh, players in, in this work in the city. That is tremendous work. And I wanna thank you for the sacrifices that it has uh, meant for you to get us to this point. And clearly there's so much more that uh, we are, we are going to uh, be achieving because of the institutional uh, infrastructure that you've put in place uh, for this work. Second, let me just say a couple of things. One is that uh, you, you may want to check through the uh, uh, chat box. You wanna, maybe you wanna leave a comment, but also what you will see in the chat box is a, a, stra a range of people who are both attending this event, but also involved in this kind of work. I mean, people like, um, an old friend of, well, maybe a long time friend, I shouldn't say old friend, uh, Jim Stanford, who's actually not in the city, he's in Vancouver, but he's, he's joining us here. Uh, the people I've worked with like Cheryl Tillak Singh are in there. There's a whole range of people who are both participating today, uh, but are also involved in this work in the city, uh, not just from the unions, but also from the community, from uh, various uh, other uh, academic institutions, uh, also from uh, government, uh, who are really important uh, to this uh, this work and this and this project. So scroll through and you'll see some of the people who are attending. The last thing I want to say is that at some point we will have a Q&A. So if you have a question uh, that you uh, want an answer to, something that uh, we can answer in uh, one or two minutes, um, go to the Q&A and leave your question there. And at the right or at the appropriate time, we will read through some of those questions and invite our panelists to uh, give us uh, responses to some of those questions. So I finally now get to introduce uh, Madi. <laughs> Madi, <laughs> Madi, Madi Semitiki is the uh, uh, interim director of the School of uh, uh, Cities and professor of geography and planning at the University of Toronto. He will give us uh, uh, just uh, an update on uh, some of the work that's going on with regard to construction around the city, some of the real uh, breakthroughs that uh, uh, Rosemary was talking about, as well as talk about the importance of this moment and the possibilities that it represents. It will also extend beyond what we've been talking about, which is uh, we've been talking about uh, uh, indigenous black and racialized populations uh, who are uh, concentrated in particular areas in the city of Toronto. Um, talking about young people, he wants to talk about, he also extended to talk about uh, the fact that they, we have an aging labor force and what that means in terms of those workers as well as the opportunity that represents. Madi? Thank you, Grace Edwards. Thank you, uh, Rosemary uh, and TCBN. Uh, it is such a pleasure to be with you tonight. Um, I have been listening and just been uh, in awe of the discussion already and how much ground has been covered uh, and how much important, uh, uh, how many important issues have been raised. And what I wanna do uh, in my time uh, is, is just broaden the discussion and give you a bit of context of how this fits into the overall uh, picture of infrastructure and planning in uh, the city uh, and, uh, and, and gives it a frame within uh, the construction industry in particular. Uh, before I get started, I wanna just pick up on uh, Grace Edwards' uh, last comment about 
uh, the importance of an organization like uh, TCBN. Uh, and Rosemary uh, made uh, the comment that uh, it is a Black-led organization uh, and an organization uh, where the demographics reflect uh, our city. And what you'll see in my discussion tonight is that this is completely unique in the construction industry. The construction industry and infrastructure more broadly has a long history of exclusion, a long history of, uh, of being predominated by uh, white men. And I think for an organization that is pushing the envelope and pushing uh, our institutions and pushing our governments and pushing our private sector uh, to be more uh, inclusive, uh, to have uh, this group pushing it is not is both not surprising and is extremely important. Uh, and it's a pleasure for me to be uh, to have been invited uh, to speak uh, to, about this uh, tonight. Now, uh, I think it barely uh, needs saying that uh, we're in the, um, the a moment of crisis. But in fact, while public health crisis and COVID uh, is at the top of everyone's mind, we're actually in the midst of three intersecting crises. Clearly, we're in the midst of a public health crisis with the pandemic. But we are also in the midst of a climate crisis uh, and a crisis of uh, systemic racism. And it's the way that these three crises are intersecting and interacting uh, as they land in our cities that is, is what is so significant about this moment uh, when it comes to the idea of rebuilding and investing and the role that the construction industry and planning uh, will play in uh, what it means to uh, achieve economic justice. Now, planning uh, and city building has a long history of exclusion. Uh, it, the, the cities that we have that Grace Edwards talked about of all of the ways that cities uh, have uh, fostered spatial inequality and uh, spatial, uh, spatial uh, uh, segregation and racism, that was baked into the way we planned our cities. That was not by accident, that was systemic and baked into the way that zoning was carried out, that lending uh, was carried out, and that hiring was carried out. So this was not an accident. The way our cities are designed and the way that uh, that they are um, uh, excluding people and the facts uh, around um, uh, the inequalities in who is contracting COVID were baked into our cities long before the pandemic hit. So the question, uh, the, the question in many ways now is, 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 is what do we do? I mean, we've seen this around the types of infrastructure projects that get built, that infrastructure can be both a vehicle of opportunity and we often talk about infrastructure as connecting communities. But we have to ask the question, which communities are being connected, by what infrastructure, and uh, in who is being displaced for those infrastructure projects to be built. And even just in recent memory in this city and in this region, we can see the impacts of what happens when we invest in infrastructure and don't focus on the community benefits, when we get captivated by the overall narrative of progress that infrastructure can bring, that infrastructure will drive economic uh, prosperity, that infrastructure will drive local economic development, that it'll improve the environment. And we don't ask the question of improve for whom. And we can see just in recent memory, uh, some of the impacts of uh, the big infrastructure projects that are coming. So we can talk about uh, the community hub at Jane and Finch, uh, which uh, had been promised to the community uh, in, in, in hard fought um, negotiations by the community and was almost erased at the stroke of a pen. And it was the response of the community, including uh, the Toronto Community Benefits Network and many others who came and, and, and um, advocated and demanded that that project remain part of uh, the Finch LRT uh, as one of the uh, benefits that comes out of uh, accept, uh, accepting a maintenance uh, facility in the community. That's just one example. We can look at uh, uh, gentrification that's happening along uh, the Eglinton line, uh, and in particular, uh, the historic Black community uh, in Little Jamaica and, and concerns around gentrification as the LRT uh, arrives in, uh, in, in the next few years. And the implications then of, uh, of a big infrastructure project coming with all of, uh, all of the pizzazz around the benefits that come from infrastructure, but it's not equally distributed, that there are also uh, significant uh, losers. And we can, we can extend that to think about what is gonna happen in, in communities like Mount Dennis uh, and in the Golden Mile as well. Uh, and this is just uh, uh, related to the Eglinton Crosstown. And there are many other projects that are now 
uh, being uh, discussed, whether it's the Ontario line, uh, which will um, uh, have stations um, in Thorncliffe and Flemington Park, uh, and also uh, many of the other transit projects that are being built. These are both huge opportunities to deliver um, uh, better connections and stitch together communities that have for too long been excluded, but they can also propel gentrification and propel displacement. And, and it's, it's in that space then that we need to think about benefit agreements, that the benefit agreements are very broad about, uh, about what gets built. Let us also focus on who builds the infrastructure because the construction industry itself is also a space of uh, exclusion and in many cases, a, a significant space of whiteness. Now, we saw, um, if we think of the construction industry as a whole, the construction industry in Canada employs around uh, 1.5 uh, million uh, Canadians and it employs about, it contributes about 7% of the Canadian GDP. So it is a significant industry. And we know that as part of the recovery efforts, governments of all levels are talking about spending billions and billions and billions of dollars in infrastructure to deliver short-term gains, but also to jumpstart the future of the economy and address those issues around climate change, public health, and systemic racism. What we know about the construction industry itself, however, is that it is um, uh, deeply unequal. On, and, and Rosemary said that just in passing, when you, when, if you were to just pass a construction site, uh, you don't need a, a statistical analysis to understand uh, who is working on those uh, job sites. But if we wanna look at the numbers in particular, what we see is that, uh, is that uh, women, um, women uh, make up uh, less than 13% uh, of the overall construction industry and less than uh, and, and, and less than five percent of workers who are actually on site, and that extends even further when we look at uh, uh, Black and Indigenous uh, people uh, and uh, people of color. The numbers are vanishingly small on our construction sites, and again, this stems from uh, what what we might call uh, well, it stems from the leadership. The leadership, when we look at the leadership of these organizations, they, are, they also lack diversity. Uh, and that, that flows into who is making the decisions, who is discussing our key uh, significant planning uh, policies, uh, and, and it's flowing into who is employed on our construction sites. Now, this isn't just, th this then plays into the tone and um, uh, the tone and um, uh, on our construction sites as well. So in the past year, we have had some horrendous issues of uh, an incidents of racism on construction sites. Uh, we have had uh, uh, nooses left on construction sites and we've had other uh, graffiti scrawled on, scrawled on sites. Just the worst type of, uh, of racism and intimidation on our uh, construction sites. And so the, the fact that, uh, in, that uh, indigenous and black uh, and people of color are not on those sites and, and, and may not have found their way into the construction industry. The construction industry has for a long time had issues around the tone on its construction site uh, and issues of, uh, of, 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 re of real uh, ingrained racism on those construction sites. Uh, and many of the uh, contractors uh, and employers who faced uh, an experience, their sites where that was experienced in the past year have come out vigorously against it and have, have uh, redoubled their efforts now uh, uh, to become a part of the solution and to look for uh, strategies uh, and to, to have zero tolerance policies and to look for strategies to address these issues. But they are not gonna go away. And it speaks to uh, the, the, the significant gaps of uh, 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 in terms of who is, is uh, working on, uh, in, on construction sites and who's gonna benefit directly then from the billions and billions of dollars that is gonna to flow uh, to infrastructure uh, in, in the coming years. So this all to, to pull this all together then, it reflects and gives us a sense of why we need community benefit agreements. We need targets because without targets, uh, there is uh, ambiguity and in the space of ambiguity, nothing will change. So we need uh, firm targets identifying uh, around workforces and we need targets around inclusion uh, for communities and, and a framework for development without displacement. In the absence of these targets, the infrastructure will come, the words will be great around inclusivity. And in the action, when we come back and reflect 10 years later, what we'll see is that uh, these, these projects, uh, in fact, propelled uh, uh, greater inequality, displacement and gentrification. We need data then 
to actually understand what is happening on these job sites uh, and who is being impacted. COVID has taught us, you know, we started out in the, in the spring talking about we're all in this together. And what we've learned through the data is that we are in fact not all in, in this together, that there are huge inequalities in terms of who's being impacted uh, and in particular uh, uh, black and indigenous uh, communities uh, and people of color being impacted. So we need disaggregated data. And finally, we need organizations to hold our governments to account. And we need organizations who are well connected across sectors, organizations who have built relationships and built trust, uh, who can speak to governments, who have connections with communities to understand their concerns uh, and can, uh, can then uh, communicate and, and, and convene forums just like this to bring people together to discuss the key issues and to come up with uh, uh, tangible and constructive solutions to go forward. So this then pulls together and, and reflects on why uh, the community benefit framework and, uh, is so important and a network like the community benefits network and its leadership and its um, uh, staff uh, uh, is, is so important in this community and in, in, in a construction industry that lacks diversity, it is so important to have a network of, of, of um, uh, uh, skilled people working uh, towards the type of uh, inclusive uh, community that we're all looking to build. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marie. Thank you for uh, both the work that you're doing, uh, the analysis, uh, the framing of the issue, and uh, the filling in in terms of the gaps of the work that's being done and what it means uh, for us to uh, uh, to make some progress on these questions in terms of uh, the actual populations that are being that are affected by the nature of the economy that uh, we have inherited. Um, I, I want to say that uh, when I was name checking, I forgot to name check a couple of really important people here. John Cartwright, who is uh, at the uh, Labour Council, has been a, both a long-term uh, advocate for community benefits and has been uh, uh, part of uh, the uh, work that has uh, enabled us to get to, to, the, to, to this place. And so is uh, Joe Mahavik, uh, a former city councillor at the city of Toronto, who is now uh, heavily involved uh, in this work. Um, if you scroll down again, as I was saying earlier on, there are a number of people who, uh, both from the community, but also from the uh, labor movement, who have and continue to do important work in this area. Ana Teresa Portillo, uh, Parkdale People's uh, Economy, uh, uh, for instance, uh, Carl uh, Andras uh, Hamilton Community Benefits Network. Uh, there is um, uh, uh, Jason Edwards, who is uh, from uh, the SAJ Property Management uh, Incorporated. It's a broad coalition, in essence. Mark Arsenal from the Ontario uh, Iron Workers District Council. Uh, Brad uh, Hollock, who is uh, with the Community Benefits Network in Windsor. Um, uh, there, there is uh, so much, uh, uh, both in terms of uh, the people who are involved in the work, as well as who are involved uh, in, this, in this discussion today, uh, that uh, there's uh, uh, Gil uh, Panarosa, who's the founder and chair of uh, AD80 Cities, uh, ambassador to World uh, urban parks and founder of the Third Act. So there's a broad cross-section of people who are involved. Um, we should uh, name check Rina Fratecelli, who is the Director of Strategic Initiatives, uh, Office of uh, Social Innovation at Ryerson University. And Maria Williams, a Procurement Manager at Turner Construction. So it is, this conversation has attracted a broad cross-section of people who have a tremendous contribution to make in how we will uh, make progress going forward. I want to to move on to uh, uh, the next presentation. Uh, Fausto Natarelli is uh, an adjunct professor at York University's uh, School of Public Policy and Administration. And he is involved in some really groundbreaking work uh, that York University is, is involved in. York, Anchor York is one of the uh, projects that uh, uh, were supported by the, the work of the Atkinson Charitable Foundation. Uh, and it involves some of the uh, activities that uh, uh, Marty was talking about earlier on. So York uh, University has made a commitment, the kind of commitment that uh, we are looking for from other institutional uh, employers and uh, critical uh, 
participants in our local economies, York University is in the northwest uh, of Toronto. And so it's an important, uh, uh, should I say, it's an, it's an important uh, corporate citizen in that area. And uh, uh, Fausto will say more about the role that they are uh, involved, the role that they have taken with regard to uh, that aspect of the work. Fausto. Great, thanks so much, uh, Grace Edward. Um, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, appreciate the opportunity to be part of this august uh, panel uh, and to uh, share um, some uh, perspectives and observations uh, and efforts um, on this important topic of uh, community benefits. Uh, I'm going to be carrying, uh, wearing two hats uh, uh, this evening. One is to um, you know, speak to you about how the university has been leveraging its economic capacity uh, and it's standing in the communities within which it's situated um, through social procurement and community benefits initiatives uh, and, uh, um, and the progress that's been made uh, to date. Um, I'm also uh, happy to share um, my past experience uh, and community benefit initiatives from my time in provincial and municipal public service uh, leading large capital projects and offer some of my own perspectives uh, on how we can enhance the scope and the reach of community benefits. So uh, let me start with the York, uh, the Anchor York uh, U initiative um, first. So by way of background, York University developed its strategic policy related to what it means uh, to be an anchor institution in the Black Creek, uh, Jane and Finch communities, uh, not quite um, four years ago. Uh, four target areas were identified around which a dynamic conversation um, around the development of mutually favorable community benefits could occur. The uh, pursuit of the goals for each of these target areas uh, now applies to all of the communities in the vicinity of the university campuses, uh, namely the Keele campus, Glendon, uh, and now uh, Markham. Next slide, please. So the focus of the strategy, um, uh, much like the themes that we've heard over the course of the, of the panel discussion, uh, is centered around the economic disadvantages, discrimination and or barriers to equal opportunity experienced by people across the GTA, uh, particularly but not limited to the key equity seeking groups. Now the university's efforts were initially focused on the communities nearby the campuses, um, but we're hopeful and we have been participating uh, in initiatives that have impacts beyond uh, those communities in which the university is, um, uh, is a neighbor. Next slide. So um, let's talk about each of the target areas for a few moments. With respect to the employment target area, the goal is to leverage the university standing as one of the largest employers in the Black Creek area and neighboring York region. Uh, accessing government programs and collaborating with key area employers the goal is to create workplace training and other employment opportunities. Uh, and Rosemary mentioned some of those uh, in her remarks a few moments ago. Next slide. Uh, with respect to the engagement um, uh, goal or strategy, the idea was um, to recognize, and it does recognize, the intrinsic reciprocal relationship that the university has with its neighboring communities. And that clearly uh, the futures of both uh, are intertwined. So the strategy identifies a number of ways to encourage communities and neighbors to access university facilities in support of economic, social, cultural, recreational activities, and even service needs. Next slide. Um, in the infrastructure uh, target area, in addition to important environmental objectives, the goal is to leverage opportunities brought about by major rapid transit investments, such as the Finch LRT, redevelopment of the Keel Finch neighborhood, and the university's own building and development programs, particularly at the Keele campus and now the new Markham campus. And there are some you know, fairly significant investments um, that are um, in progress or in the pipeline uh, for a significant building um, elements at the Keele campus and of course the new campus in, uh, in Markham. Next slide. Uh, the area that's um, probably been the most active in the last year uh, or so is the procurement uh, target area, um, where the university was encouraged by the Anchor Toronto Anchor TO initiative, of which the university is an active participant, 
and in 2019, a procurement policy was adopted with guiding values and principles that included promoting equal opportunity and inclusion, removing barriers experienced by equity seeking communities, building a culture of social procurement at the university, leveraging the university's purchasing to benefit local economies, and then lastly, balancing equity goals, accountability, transparency, and efficiency. Next slide. So this slide, you can see some of the early uh, results, and I need to stress that they are early when you accept um, or understand that the procurement uh, policy was really only uh, implemented in, uh, in 2019. So this is about a year and a half, a year and three quarters worth of, um, of results. Um, so with respect to apprenticeships, the results vary, um, but we see as much as 14% uh, uh, of the hours that uh, apprentices need towards their uh, certifications uh, have been achieved through York's projects. Uh, roughly over $140,000 in wages um, uh, have been paid to apprentices across three projects, uh, forecasting 36 apprenticeship opportunities across six different projects. On the social procurement uh, spectrum, uh, York has two pilot projects with a minimum social procurement spend of approximately 5% of the overall project spend. Uh, York has designed an FAQ for all future uh, bid packages to ensure that social procurement um, is built into the, uh, the bid responses. So again, that speaks to Rosemary's point of um, incorporating these strategies as uh, business as usual. Uh, York has prepared template letters to general contractors to use uh, to allow their suppliers to attest to their local and equity seeking hiring practices. Uh, and again, uh, you know, in excess of $260,000 has been allocated uh, as social procurement spend on one project alone. Next slide. So from an advocacy uh, perspective, the university is very supportive of uh, the continued development of strategies that enhance um, the prevalence and the scope of community benefit arrangements across public sector expenditures and investments. The efforts of the Toronto Community Benefits Network are very complementary to those of the university and York supports TCBN's efforts to increase the scope and prevalence of community benefits arrangements. The City of Toronto's efforts and its commitment to community benefits development and implementation are to be complemented, um, commended in fact, uh, and the university is currently reviewing the release of the City of Toronto staff report. Again, Rosemary mentioned that uh, earlier on uh, regarding the community benefits policy framework and is looking forward to the deliberations of the Executive Committee uh, of Council in the coming days. Next slide. Uh, so from um, you know, my own perspectives and my own experience, uh, having spent uh, 35 years uh, prior to my uh, current teaching role in provincial and, uh, and public uh, municipal public administration, um, you know, um, these themes are essentially going to recast and recap what we've heard throughout the, the panel discussion. Um, uh, so clearly, as you've heard, and, and many of you are, are very much aware, uh, the awareness and the practical knowledge of community benefits arrangements is increasing rapidly uh, throughout the world and, and here at home. I mean, you've heard some of the terrific work that uh, TCBN is, is doing to advance the knowledge base and the capability and the capacity base. Uh, community benefits have been secured through a range of public sector, and I'm happy to say uh, increasingly private sector expenditures and investments. Now, given that broader operating context, uh, I suggest and would recommend the following considerations be incorporated into infrastructure planning. Uh, first, the expanded use of community benefits arrangements should be among the strategies deployed to address, grow to address growing inequalities. Now, exploring the opportunities, engaging communities and prospective partners needs to occur early in the infrastructure development cycle well before the procurement phase. Uh, and in my experience, this was where um, uh, there were a lot of lost opportunities, particularly around these mega projects that are delivered through public-private partnerships. Uh, not enough planning was done early enough to engage those communities and those partners. And what you ended up with was, uh, you know, frankly, a bit of a you know, scramble uh, in the last 18 months, 12 to 18 months uh, of these projects that would have a life cycle sometimes of 10 years, uh, for the community benefits uh, arrangements to uh, emerge and to be part of the procurement process. Uh, that you know, imposes a, a quite a strain uh, on the, the likelihood that you have 
um, uh, you know, an effective community benefits arrangement, one that's supported by the community uh, and optimizes all of the opportunities. Um, public sector uh, sponsors of infrastructure expenditures and investments should seek out community organizations like the Toronto Community Benefits Network and engage them as strategic partners to accelerate the effective use of community benefit strategies and techniques. Uh, I can tell you in my um, you know, career, uh, particularly on a large project uh, like the Windsor Border Project that's uh, underway right now, uh, my team and I at MTO would have loved uh, you know, to have had the, um, uh, the added capacity and strength and information base of a Toronto Community Benefits Network uh, when we were developing Community Benefits Network uh, 13 years ago. Um, I'm happy to say that the Windsor Detroit Bridge Authority is carrying on and, and uh, for example, uh, you know, doing amazing work uh, in broadly um, based uh, community benefits uh, across a number of, um, uh, of themes. Uh, and that gives you a sense of the art of the possible, but you need to start early. Uh, you need to engage, uh, you know, capable partners in the community. Uh, the public sector and the public service uh, doesn't have to do it, uh, you know, on its own, right? Um, additional resources should be deployed to support the development of operational policies and practices, uh, including data collection. Uh, we've heard about the importance and the significance of that this evening, um, uh, as well as subsequent research to further strengthen the foundations of community benefits. And then lastly, um, you know, leveraging the available body of practice and expertise to mitigate risks associated with setting hard targets, uh, again, that will further increase the potential for benefits. There are enough case studies, uh, both in North America and around the world, um, uh, from which we can learn uh, so that we can establish with confidence uh, hard targets. Um, because as we've heard throughout the evening, uh, you know, without these goals, you really can't make uh, progress and you really can't leverage the now you know, hundreds of billions of dollars uh, that are being invested in uh, infrastructure uh, in Canada alone. Uh, these are staggering numbers uh, and they need to be uh, leveraged in a way that provides for broader benefits to adjacent communities. So that's all for me, uh, Grace Edwards. Uh, thanks everyone for your time and attention. Fausto, thank you so very much, uh, both for the work that you're doing as uh, an institutional champion, uh, both within York University, but also previously in uh, the uh, government, in the public, in the public sector. Uh, just to pick up on the last point you made, I just want to emphasize also that what is measured counts. And so the question of us measuring and having uh, that evidence and evidence-based uh, policy making is, is really critical. Uh, we have very little time left, but I want to move on to uh, a few Q's and A's, and then we will have uh, Chris Campbell close. Uh, now, we will not be able to get all the uh, questions uh, in, but let, let me just read out about four questions and I'll ask either any one of the, the panel members to uh, attempt those questions. I'll start with the first one, the question about uh, the conversation thus far has not addressed the condition of persons with disabilities. Um, I'll take some responsibility for that because part of the framing involved me talking about particular populations that are historically disadvantaged and I did not include persons with disabilities, I suddenly uh, it was an oversight on my part. Personal disabilities are a critical part of uh, uh, the uh, communities that we need to address uh, through these processes. So here are four questions. How do you define local community when it is a large scale project like the Crosstown LRT? Let me read out all the questions and then uh, you pick up on uh, those, those questions. Um, how can we strengthen the accountability lanes to make certain that those still developing community, those two developing communities are benefiting from the good union infrastructure work? Um, there's a question about white collar jobs. Uh, and this was uh, directed at Rosemary uh, specifically. Uh, Non-unionized white collar jobs. Are we not concerned about those? How do we include them in the inclusion uh, framework? Uh, and I guess uh, one more, uh, what factors into setting the right hard targets? And the, the last one is, do community benefits negotiations include, uh, uh, include in, uh, uh, green buildings, ensuring green buildings? So 
Uh, whoever wants to take any of those questions, uh, uh, please go ahead. Uh, maybe I should start with uh, Rosemary. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, so uh, community benefits does include opportunities outside of the construction work. Not everybody wants to or can be a construction worker, but there are so many opportunities that uh, construction projects do generate, including those um, uh, you know, entry-level, mid-level management type positions, professional administrative and technical jobs, even being at the uh, inside of the office, you know, those designers and architects. Uh, you know, finance, human resources, um, you know, marketing and promotions. Oftentimes people don't understand that, uh, you know, the construction industry doesn't just necessarily mean, uh, you know, being out there, um, you know, uh, in, in, in the, um, you know, in the trenches, um, you know, building the physical um, and infrastructure. So yes, we do support that work. And in fact, with the Metro Lakes Eglinton Crosstown project, uh, there have been, I believe, over 200 positions in those professional admin technical uh, that were generated as a result. But then uh, there are the feeder um, uh, um, uh, suppliers. Uh, for example, through social enterprise, we've also been able uh, to generate opportunities for those small businesses that do catering. Because every construction worker, they must eat. <laughs> and they, you know, um, uh, things like, um, uh, 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 printing and uh, events planning and um, even even arts and um, and and uh, you know on the, on hoarding uh, hoardings um, have been uh, small contracts that were generated for the community. So we need to look at the wholesomeness of the project and look at you know how we can have that conversation with the general contractor to really tease out what opportunities are there for the community. I did see a question about, you know, what about, um, uh, you know, peoples with disabilities? What about peoples who are low income? What about people who meet other criteria uh, and other people who are equity seeking groups that are not black, indigenous or racialized? TCBN talks about a focus for black, indigenous and racialized because we recognize that these are folks who have been historically removed uh, from the construction industry and they need additional supports uh, to be put in place, to be intentionally targeting and supporting them. And there are people from these communities who are low income and who are disabled and who are, uh, you know, from the LGBTQ um, uh, community as well. And we need to support all of them. And, you know, when you think about how do you determine a target, it's about a coming to a consensus on what could be achieved and pushing the envelope a little bit more. If we're going to choose a 10% target, then guess what? We really need to tighten it. Increase that target to reflect more of what the city looks like. At the city of Toronto, we see 51% of the population already being racialized. 50% of the population is already women. 10% is such a low bar. And that's why we've decided that we're gonna be pushing for a target that directly focuses on these groups. But let's think about how can we actually increase that to include more people. And the other 90% of the construction industry does include, um, it needs to include everyone. Um, you know, all Torontonians should have the opportunity equitably uh, to be able to benefit from those opportunities. Thank you. Um, thanks, um, uh, Grace Edwards. Uh, I mean, I, I agree. I think, uh, you know, uh, Rosemary is, uh, is bang on and it's all possible. Um, um, what has to change, though, is, um, you know, a, a city like Toronto, uh, the province, uh, other large, uh, you know, municipalities, uh, frankly, even, you know, small and mid-sized municipalities can make a contribution as well. Uh, but they need to uh, prioritize. They need to invest in, uh, you know, and I'm not talking a, a large uh, contingent of people within uh, municipal uh, government or even provincial government, uh, but, a, you know, a, a, a capable, um, agile unit whose job it is to be aware of what's possible, um, leverage the best practices in other jurisdictions, convert that into operational into policies and operational practices that reflect the, lo the, the, the local context, right? And then leverage, uh, you know, um, uh, interactions with TCBN, with the United Way, 
uh, you know, um, with a lot of local organizations who are very attuned uh, to what the local needs are and package those in a way that when the procurement process comes along, uh, you know, we don't have, uh, don't get me wrong, I don't think there's anything wrong with this, but it's not particularly efficient where we don't have large contractors suddenly trying to, you know, uh, turn themselves into charitable organizations, right? I mean, their job is to build, it's to build efficiently and to have their workforce reflect the communities that they're in. And the most, you know, effective uh, way to do that is, is to uh, join a multi-sector, um, uh, you know, partnership, public sector, private sector, non-governmental sector, everyone bringing their competitive advantage and solving these problems, uh, you know, in a heads up way. So government obviously has a key role in uh, in creating that, uh, you know, ecosystem to, to borrow Rosemary's, uh, you know, term, uh, so that those parties uh, can, you know, leverage their competitive advantage to solve these problems, right? Uh, and again, we're talking hundreds of billions of dollars, okay? So, you know, you can eke out some room uh, without having to spend any more money, frankly, uh, and, uh, you know, achieve these uh, objectives and set, uh, you know, uh, reasonable and hard targets. Thank you. Muddy. Thank you, Grace Edwards. Uh, uh, a few uh, thoughts. One is with respect to how we're going to change organizations. Um, I think it's going to take two things. It's going to take advocacy and the work of organizations like TCBN to push from the outside. And frankly, it's going to take people, at, it's going to take greater diversity at the top of these organizations. If community benefit network, if community benefit agreements are uh, something that's seen as an afterthought, something that is seen as uh, um, an add-on to projects and a cost line uh, rather than something that is baked directly into the benefit of why we build infrastructure, then they will be uh, uh, applied in that way. They'll be seen and used as uh, uh, something that uh, is, is, is carried out after all of the decisions are made. Uh, the leadership of our organizations, uh, of our major anchor organizations in this city, uh, both the, the management leadership and the boards of directors uh, do not reflect uh, the city that we work in. Uh, and it, it trickles down into the types of decisions around, uh, around um, uh, labor, the labor force and around issues of uh, how these projects touch down in terms Terms of their benefits. Now, someone also asked a question about green buildings, and uh, that relates to my earlier comments about uh, climate change. Um, I think when we're thinking about uh, infrastructure projects, uh, the best way to conceive of this uh, going forward, I think, is as, is as a layer, that the infrastructure that we're building, if it's a transit project in particular, that is the foundation upon which we can uh, then see uh, changes in, in and, 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 and uh, uh, changes in the communities uh, uh, around those, uh, uh, those infrastructure projects and the layering of infrastructure uh, on top. So that includes uh, affordable housing, which is desperately needed. It includes spaces for local small businesses so that we're ensuring that, that, that as communities change, there's not displacement, uh, but rather, and it, and, and it includes green spaces and, and public parks. Uh, so that, so that one of the real lessons from the pandemic is that open space and good quality green space is critical to uh, a successful city and is, is, is critical towards uh, uh, social resilience uh, as well as environmental resilience. And so the layering of infrastructure through benefit agreements, I think is central then uh, to understanding how we're gonna achieve uh, a, a, a true uh, social inclusion from all of this infrastructure money that's being spent. Okay, great, thank you so much. So let me ask three more questions and ask you for 30 second responses so that we have enough time for uh, Chris to wrap. So a question directly to Mary. Uh, given the uh, entrenched systemic discrimination and anti-black racism and heteropatriarchy at the construction sites that you spoke to, what kinds of cultural systemic changes are needed within the sector to make these jobs and job sites uh, palatable? Uh, even fulfilling for uh, Blacks, Indigenous, and uh, people of color workers. And then the last two questions are, how can, <clears throat> how can one connect with the uh, equity-seeking construction uh, companies that are interested in bidding on uh, ICI projects? Uh, and I guess the last question is, no, two more, quick, uh, quick. Should there be legislation that directs the development 
of the frameworks that we're talking about, community building space frameworks uh, that are required uh, uh, at the, should that, should that happen at the provincial, uh, provincial level and certainly possibly at the national level. And uh, last, can anyone speak more about uh, the arts project that TCBN has been involved in? So 30 seconds in response to each one of those, uh, uh, anyone can take any of those up. We'll start with, uh, maybe we'll start with Mari this time around. Um, I know that question was directed at me. I think there's obvious, there's other people on this call uh, like Chris Campbell uh, and Rosemary uh, who can answer that question uh, way better than I can. All I would say is, um, is, uh, is, is, is leading with uh, zero tolerance. Um, I would suggest that if management's bonuses were tied to having no racism on their sites, uh, that there would be much greater impetus to eliminate that today, right away. Like, so I think, I, th I think that there's, there's clearly cultures of, uh, in the construction industry that need to be changed. Uh, there's leadership, and then there's making sure that the targets are matched and, and the zero tolerance is matched with real uh, uh, stakes and real uh, um, uh, consequences if they're not. I would support exactly what you're saying, Matthew. And I just want to add that with the TCBN, we've been working in collaboration with the uh, uh, community labor and the um, uh, construction industry to, um, you know, especially after the deuces were found on construction site, mm -hmm. it was really devastating for the young people participating in our next gen builders uh, mentoring program. Many of them for the majority were black and uh, impacted them uh, very much uh, directly. And so, you know, we got, got out front of that. We spoke with our partners, with unions and with the contractors. And, uh, you know, we know that this, uh, they denounce um, this. And then how do we go take it to the next level? One of the things that we're working with the industry on is what we call the Building Diversity Awards and Recognition Program. This is about looking at uh, number one, an education program within the industry that talks about the global benchmarks for diversity and inclusion and look at a continuous improvement process that could be established uh, within these companies to be able to change their practices over time and produce, provide them with a, a roadmap uh, to be able to do that. And then uh, as they're making changes and as they're leading on equity and diversity, recognize them uh, with an, um, that and elevate their brand to really demonstrate now, here are the, the good employers that you can look to uh, for, um, you know, to, to um, as examples um, that, that you can follow, that you could um, emulate, you know. Uh, and so we're working in partnership with Ellis Don and Acon and Crosslinks to be able to achieve this. Uh, one of the questions about TCBN uh, in the arts program, we particularly did not participate in the program, but uh, some social enterprises along the Eglinton Crossdown, there was some hoarding. And for example, Urban Arts um, was very much involved in uh, designing some of the, um, uh, the, the artwork on the, the hoarding along Eglinton. So let me ask first to answer the question about legislation. Uh, Again, 30, yes, 30 seconds. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm a big fan. Uh, in fact, uh, we were really quite pleased uh, uh, when I was at Metrolinx for the um, uh, here Ontario LRT. Uh, the province had just introduced the uh, legislation that required the community benefits arrangements on all uh, you know major transit projects. Um, disappointed that the current uh, administration isn't following through with the development of regulations uh, and isn't mandating that same expectation as I understand it and maybe Rosemary can correct me if I'm wrong on all of the other you know um, tens of billions of dollars that are being invested in the other transit projects I think that's a shame uh, yes uh, other you know jurisdictions in Europe for example there is legislation that mandates these arrangements uh, so uh, certainly as a taxpayer I would be supportive of legislation to uh, you know um, bring these uh, kinds of initiatives about. Mm -hmm. Rosemary, I'm going to hold you there because I need to get uh, Chris Campbell in uh, with the last word. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to uh, uh, facilitate this conversation. It's an important conversation. Uh, it's just the beginning of these kinds of conversations uh, in this environment. Hopefully, many more. Uh, as we're not meeting in physical places, we'll be able to meet this way and then continue the work. Uh, Chris, thanks for uh, wrapping up and I am passing over to you.
Thank you, thank you, thank you. So like he says, I'm Chris Campbell, the Equity Diversity Representative of the Carpenters District Council. Um, to wrap up, I'd like to thank our co-sponsors for this event, Atkinson Foundation, University of Toronto School of Cities, City Building Ryerson City Institute of York University. Um, Last year was a tumultuous journey for us in the construction industry with the advent of COVID-19, uh, George Floyd, uh, Black Lives Matter, nooses on construction site. Uh, notwithstanding that all these struggles, the TCBN has a huge or has had a huge increase in young people, in youth signing up from the local community. And that's just just some, um, Great, it's good to, to see that with all these things happening, the youths are still persevering and uh, coming through and looking for the opportunity. I also want to touch on something. Uh, okay, we often use Ahmed Abdi's picture on our posters to promote the TCBN. He's a young man that came to Canada from Somalia. He often tell me about how much he was turned away from the construction site but finally got a chance at a career in the trades through the TCBN. Today, he's um, making journeyman's rate of pay, which is in, within the 40 bucks an hour range, plus pension, plus benefits. He's married, he's the father of a beautiful young girl, and he's living the Canadian dream. So, you know, we're very proud of him. Ahmed is also a mentor, a mentor, at the TCBN Next Gen Builders Mentorship Program. Like Rosemary often talk about the mentorship program. This is someone that was successful and he came back to help others. So he's now paying it forward to the next generation of apprentices and I was very proud of him. Um, I've met hundreds of Ahmed over the years uh, that are desperately trying to start a career on these multi-billion dollar projects in their local community. And that is why these discussion today with all the, 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 the Palinists, uh, the, you know, the, the, the lady that introduced us earlier um, and also, also our, um, our, our, our other staff that's helping. Now, um, I want to also thank the planning committee for their dedication and commitment. Namely, we talked about him earlier, but I wanna mention a few people, folks like Joe Mahevic, John Cartwright, Liban, Gerber Michael, Kumsa Baker, and all the staff of the TCBN. Uh, Colette Murphy, Chief Executive Officer of the Atkinson Foundation, a community partner since the inception of this TCBN, um, your intentious uh, advocacy for social and economic justice work is uh, runs in tangent to what we're doing at the TCBN. Thank you, thank you for welcoming everyone today. Grace Edward Kalabuzi, um, you're on the ball. You've been doing a great job. Grace Edwards Kalabuzi is the associate professor in the department of policies and public administration at the U, sorry, Ryerson University. Interesting question that identified the importance of the TCN to the youths of Toronto. Questions um, that you've brought forward that identify the elephant in the room that resists change. You kept the panelists on time. You kept them, um, you know, just keep going. Thank you, Grace, you've done a wonderful job. Matt, Matt Siamiteki, Interim Director of the School of Cities and Professor of Geography and Planning at the University of Toronto. Panelists, good. You've done a wonderful job. You updated us as to where the construction industry is at. Um, the slow and resistance, resistance, yes, to change. The importance of the moment, building on it, infrastructure program, if not now, when? Knowing we have an aging labor force, now is the time, Matt, for you to tell us about what we need to improve, what we need to change. Thank you, Matt. Fausto Natarelli, 
adjunct professor, York University School of Public Policy and Administration. Thank you for explaining the importance of having a focus that's relevant to the community, setting and reaching targets, data gathering. This is highlighted at the Markham and Keele campus construction project of the York University. Thank you, Foster. Last but not least, Rosemary Powell, the executive director of the Toronto Community Benefits. I often call her behind her by Miss TCBN. <laughs> you have grown this uh, organization exponentially over a short period of time. Uh, you gave us today a brief history and background of the TCBN and its relevance to today. She also updated us on the TCBN struggles and challenges. Rosemary, thank you. Thank you for putting this together. Thank you. Lastly, this is what it's all about. This is why we're having a, a webinar. At the end of it, we want you to take, at the end of it, we want you to take action. The city of Toronto adopted a strong community benefit framework policy. Sign the letter that's posted right now, it should be posted, right, at, at uh, www.communitybenefits.ca city underscore of underscore Toronto to your local city councillor and the mayor letting them know your support, at least your support for at least 10% are in target on all projects, all major projects in Toronto. There needs to be a more clear definition of equity seeking groups to locate opportunity or to, for local opportunities for those who need it most. Black, indigenous and racialized group. And that you support the Toronto Community Benefits, a strategic partner of the city to help implement the CBA framework. Thank you all for joining us today. And on that note, the meeting, the webinar is adjourned. Thank you again.